welcome to Our Lady of Lourdes and St. Vincent de Paul. My name is Brother Michael and I'm delighted that we have a day with Mary. I must admit this is the first day with Mary that I myself am experiencing as as far as I know I think this is the first time this church has been fortunate enough to host such a wonderful day and later on we'll be consecrating this parish to her Immaculate Heart. So let's continue with the way we should proceed. Ave Maria. We only have to hear or recite any litany to Our Lady to hear the many different titles that have been given to our Blessed Mother. Where do these titles come from? Is it that just people with a great devotion to Our Lady just invent these new titles? In the first reading, we heard the opening. The heavens were open and the Ark of the Covenant was seen. And one of the titles of Our Lady is the Ark of the Covenant. Why? If we go back to the Ark of the Covenant, this was this box which Moses was given specific instructions to build. And it was initially in the tent of meeting and it followed them through the desert and eventually it was put into the uh, temple when that was built. Let's remember that it contained the Ten Commandments, the Word of God. Later on, Moses was instructed to put the manna into it. The manna, the bread from heaven that fed them through the desert. And then finally, Aaron's rod was put into it. Aaron was the first high priest. Now, before the exile by the Babylonians, when they invaded um, and took out and destroyed Jerusalem, the prophet Jeremiah was told to take the Ark of the Covenant and hide it. And it was not to be seen again until an appropriate time. So here we now have this passage in the book of Revelation. Heavens were opened and the Ark of the Covenant was seen. What did it look like? Then we had the description of Mary. So why is Mary the Ark of the Covenant? Because in her womb she had Jesus, the Word of God. Jesus is also our bread of life, symbolic of the manna. And Jesus is the High Priest. But also we see Mary crowned. Our Lady of Fatima crowned and we heard in the book of Revelation that she was crowned. Again, where does this title come from? I'll broaden it out a bit. To understand the Catholic Church, we need to have some understanding of the Old Testament and our salvation history. We're all very familiar when architects, particularly when they have a big project to build, they initially okay, draw up their plans and then build a little model in miniature for people to see and approve. Well, God, I think, has done exactly the same thing. We can look back in the Old Testament and see that God produced an earthly model, an earthly prototype of the true kingdom of heaven. Have you ever thought of it in this way? Let me expand a bit. For example, the Hebrews were in bondage to Pharaoh for all those years in slavery and God delivered them but then they spent 40 years wandering in the desert where they had to learn to trust and depend on God before he took them into the promised land. We're born in bondage to sin because of original sin but by the Paschal mystery we're released from the bonds of sin but still have to spend a time, it may be short or it may, may be many years in the desert of this earthly life before we learn, and there we need to learn and trust in God before hopefully we pass on into the kingdom of the promised land of heaven. 
Well, you may be wondering, what's this got to do with Mary? Well, in the Old Testament, we read about how God established a royal dynasty for the Jewish people, starting with King Saul, but again, he failed, but then moving on to King David. And it was with David that God made his covenant and that his son would be an everlasting king ruling over the 12 tribes. Sadly, as we know, the Israelites didn't keep their side of the covenant and things collapsed. The kingdom divided and the 10 tribes to the north were taken off into exile by the Assyrians in 722, never to be heard of again. And then in 1587, the two remaining tribes of Judah and Benjamin, they were taken off into exile by Babylon, albeit they did return 70 years later. But of course, God is faithful to his covenant. And as we know, he sent his son Jesus to rebuild and restore the kingdom of David. Albeit that now the true kingdom of the definitive son of David, Jesus. That's why Jesus is called the son of David. And the church is the restored kingdom of Judah and Israel, onto which were grafted all the Gentile nations, that's us. So to understand the structure of the church, we need to look back into the Old Testament and see the structure of the Davidic royal household. Well, there were 12 tribes, descended from the 12 sons of Jacob. That's why the 12 apostles. Now, when the king was absent, e.g. when David went off to war, the kingdom was left in the hands of, let's call him the prime minister. In Hebrew, it's the al-habayit, over the household. And I just want to read a short extract from the book of Isaiah, when there was a problem with the al-habayit, over the household, and he had to be replaced. This is in Isaiah chapter 22. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Go to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him, What have you to do here? You shame of your master's house. I will thrust you from your office, and you will be pulled down from your station. In that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and will bind your sash on him, and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the keys of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. And they will hang on him the whole, the whole honor of his father's house." Does that sound rather familiar? Because those are nearly the exact words used by Jesus when he made Peter his al habayit So after he was deporting, like David going to war, going up to heaven, he left his prime minister over the household, the Pope, the Father. That's why you call him Papa. And he said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And Isaiah, whatever you open shall be opened, whatever you shut, and the keys of the kingdom. So we can see that Jesus is re-establishing the Davidic household as his church. Now, royal families are going out of fashion, although we've preserved ours in this country. We're much more familiar with the situation that when we have a king, as we do now with King Charles, then his wife, Camilla, is the queen. But that would have been a major problem back in 1000 BC because the king had many wives. Read Solomon had 300. So which one would be queen? But there was one person who was unique and could always be identified. And that was the mother of the king. And the king's mother sat on the throne as his queen. Let me read you another passage of scripture from the first book of Kings just after Solomon has been anointed as king. It's in the first book of Kings, chapter 2. Then Adonijah, 
the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, said, I have something to say to you. She said, Speak. And he said, Please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you, to give me Apishak, the Shumanmite, as my wife. Bathsheba said, Very well, I will speak for you to the king. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. And the king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. Then he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother, and she sat on his right. Then she said, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. So we can hear, see here in the Old Testament that the respect, the reverence that Solomon shows to his mother. She's seated at his right as his queen. And we see her role there interceding for others. So is it any surprise then that Jesus, who is now the everlasting king, that's why the last liturgical Sunday of the year is the feast of Christ the king, he installs his mother as the queen. But there is more. In baptism we became adopted sons and daughter of God, so adopted brothers and sisters of Christ. So Christ is our king, but also our brother. Mary is our queen, but also our mother. And so as to make absolutely sure there was no confusion about this, Jesus made sure he told about us about this. And that was the gospel passage where Jesus is at the foot of the cross and he says those words to John. John, this is your mother. John representing all of us. Therefore, we are her children. I was going to say, is that a wonderful image? No, it's not an image. It's a true reality. Our blessed lady is our queen and our mother. There's many other biblical images I could use to enhance our understanding of Our Lady. Let's, for the moment, be happy to meditate on that reality. Before we end, what impact should this have on our lives? We are familiar with the many miracles Jesus performed. But let us not forget the miracles that are happening today. I think, particularly, that we are a Lady of Lourdes. What about those miracles that are happening in Lourdes? Yes, not many have been, you could say, formally recognized as miracles, but I'm sure every pilgrimage there are miracles that happen to individuals that will never be reported. And as we saw in that film of Fatima, it was through Our Lady that the miracles were done in Fatima. So let us consecrate ourselves to Mary, Immaculate Queen and Mother. And we'll be later on before the reality of the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And we'll be meditating on the mysteries of the Most Holy Rosary, looking at these events through the eyes of Mary herself. But I'd like to close with an unusual prayer addressed to Mary, the Queen. And this is a, a prayer going back to the fourth century from St. Ephraim. He was a deacon. Incidentally, that has great things for me because I was a permanent deacon for eight years before, and a married deacon before my wife died and I'd been called to the priesthood. And I quote from his prayer. My immaculate and thoroughly pure Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Queen of the universe, hope of the despairing, you are the joy of the saints, the peacemaker between sinners and God, the advocate of the abandoned, the haven of the shipwrecked. You are the consolation of the world, the ransom of captives, the comfortus of the afflicted, the salvation of the universe. O great Queen, we fly to your protection. We have no trust in anyone, anyone but you, O most faithful Virgin. After God, you are our only hope. We call ourselves your servants. Do not allow Satan to drag us into hell. Hail, most wonderful mediatrix between God and men, Mother of our Saviour, to whom be glory and honour with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.